Asa Buddy Candler Jr. was born in 1880 to Asa Candler Sr. That same year, Asa Sr. bought the recipe for Coca-Cola from its inventor, chemist John Pemberton. Asa Sr. then went on to found the Coca-Cola Company in 1892. Buddy attended Emory College located in Oxford, Georgia at that time. He was not a good student, often getting in trouble, skipping classes in church and smoking. He barely passed and graduated in 1899. Asa Sr. had built Coca-Cola to be a family company. He employed cousins, sons, nephews, his son-in-law and his oldest son, Howard. So it was expected that Buddy would join the company too. Buddy was sent to Los Angeles to help run the newly opened West Coast branch. His cousin Samuel was already out there and was told to keep an eye on Buddy, but Samuel introduced Buddy to all of the vices LA had to offer. The West Coast branch didn't thrive the way Asa expected, so he had Buddy return home in June 1900. After his West Coast adventure, Buddy went on to have various careers, all funded or arranged for by his father. He was a bookkeeper at a mill, shipping clerk at Coca-Cola, and sat on the board of directors of an insurance company before he opened the Atlanta Speedway. After it went under, he purchased land in the Druid Hills section of Atlanta to become a farmer and worked in his father's real estate side of business. Buddy's office was located in the Candler Building, where none other than Harry Houdini rented office space. When Asa became mayor of Atlanta in 1916, he divested himself of his business interests by passing them on to his children. Buddy and his four siblings grew tired of running Coca-Cola and sold it for $25 million. Buddy was $5 million richer. He and his wife Helen became socialites and started building a mansion on their Druid Hills land named Briarcliff. Not wanting their lives to be disrupted by the construction, Buddy, Helen and their children boarded a ship and headed to Asia. At the time, the Philippines were under US control and was a vacation destination for rich Americans. In the 1920s, Magic was in fashion and was a hobby for rich, high-society men. During a trip to the Philippines, sometime between 1923 and 1925, Buddy became enamored with magic. He met a local man named Jose Cruz, who was a magician and performer. Buddy asked Jose to be his personal magic assistant and moved to Atlanta to live at Briarcliff. On April 7, 1925, 24-year-old Jose Cruz arrived in the U.S. along with his brother Philomen and their friend Vincenzo de Vera. They took up residence in an apartment above the garage at Briarcliff. Buddy bought expensive, high-end magic-related items and threw magic-related parties. By the 1930s, he started flying in famous magicians by private plane to attend his soirees. He even had a private rail car that he used to travel to events hosted by the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Even Buddy's son took part in learning and performing magic. But things took a sinister turn on January 18, 1931. Briarcliff groundskeeper James Stark was doing his morning rounds and noticed a car sitting near the putting green on the south side of the 42-acre property at approximately 6 a.m. After doing his rounds and seeing nobody else around, he approached the car to see who it belonged to. That is when he noticed the horrific scene inside the car. Jose Cruz was dead, a gunshot through his temple. 
Gladys Fricks, killed by a bullet to her abdomen, was sitting on his lap. Her head was on his left shoulder and her left arm was draped over his shoulder. Jose Cruz had his left arm around Gladys. His right arm was on the seat and Buddy's 32 caliber pistol with a pearl handle was inches away. A note was found in the car that read, To whom it may concern, we, Gladys Fricks and Jose Cruz, are taking our lives because we love each other, but due to objections of Louise Fricks and Mrs. J.T. Clay, we can't find a way to be together in peace. We love each other and we rather die and be together always than to be parted from each other. And goodbye to all and may God forgive us. Stark ran to inform Buddy and to phone police. Sheriff Jake Hall and undertaker Addison Turner attended the scene. They agreed that their deaths had occurred six to eight hours earlier, between approximately 11 p.m. to 12 a.m. Upon examination, Turner declared that Gladys had been shot through the right side, the bullet piercing her abdomen and exiting through her left side. Cruz was shot through the brain with the bullet having entered his right temple, with the bullet exiting from the left side of his head near the top of his skull. Turner declared both of their deaths had been instantaneous. There was no sign of a struggle. Buddy claimed that he did not know that Cruz had his gun. Gladys had met Jose when she attended one of his magic shows. He was 30 and she was 19 years old and worked as a stenographer. They met up after the show and talked for hours. She told him where she lived so that Jose could come visit her. Mr. and Mrs. Fricks did not approve of the relationship and told Jose not to come around anymore. Gladys and Jose continued to meet in secret for the next six months. They decided to stand up to her parents, but Gladys began getting cold feet. On January 17th, Jose and Gladys had a date. They met up with her cousin and a group of friends for lunch. When they left the group, they told them they would meet up with them later at the same street corner. They sped away in Jose's car. When police searched the car, they found one suicide note, one love note, two slates used in a magic trick, and one pearl handled dagger. Two more notes were found during a search of Cruz's Briarcliff apartment addressed to Buddy. None had Gladys's signature or writing on them. Gladys's family portrayed Jose as a stalker. Her sister, Louise Fricks, said that Gladys did not love him, but was too afraid of him to dump him. She claimed Gladys said he would hurt her if she ever broke up with him. Louise claimed that Jose carried the dagger that was found in the car for protection and that he had told her that it had a poison tip that would kill anybody within minutes if he used it. The police declared the dagger had been part of one of Jose's magic tricks. The Fricks's neighbor told police that Jose had given him a scrapbook and talked about how he was tired of trying to win approval for his relationship with Gladys. Gladys's friend, W.L. Bennett, declared that he had been Gladys's fiance and that they were to be married in several months. He said that they hadn't announced it yet that after Gladys's death, her parents gave him permission to tell people. Bennett's father said that his son was not engaged to Gladys. Gladys's cousin, May Adair, testified that it had been Gladys's idea to go out on a date with Jose Cruz and that she had asked May to help her coordinate meeting him without her parents finding out. They met up and went to Green Dragon Restaurant in Hapeville. Her friends described Gladys as being happy and having fun. 
Gladys said she had to go home, so they all headed back to Atlanta with plans to meet at a diner. Her friends waited a long time for her and Jose to arrive. When they did show up, Jose drove past them. Some of her friends claimed that they saw Gladys screaming and pounding on the passenger window. Well, one of them said they didn't see Gladys in the car at all. They arrived at Briarcliff and parked near the golf course sometime between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. A coroner's jury was quickly convened on the same day the deaths were discovered. The jury declared that Gladys Fricks had been murdered by Jose Cruz before he took his own life. They believed that Gladys had no part in the pact and didn't know what Jose was about to do. Gladys Fricks was buried on January 20th, 1931 in Rose Hill Cemetery in Austell, Georgia. Jose Cruz's arrangements were taken care of by Buddy who had Jose buried at Westview Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Jose's brother and friend returned to the Philippines shortly afterwards. However, questions remain. Jose and Buddy were close. They were always together and knew about each other's private lives. Certainly, Buddy would have noticed that Jose was struggling. Jose left Buddy not one, but two notes, the contents of which have never been revealed, not even at the inquest. Despite being such a sensational case, Buddy was able to use his connections to make the story go away. Asa Sr. had connections to both law enforcement and the coroner. Investigators worked quickly and kept any evidence connected to Buddy out of the press. There was also the Adair family connection that necessitated the Candlers to do what they can to keep it out of the press. The Candler family did a large amount of business with the Adairs. May Adair, Gladys's cousin, was a cousin of one of Buddy's closest business associates, Forrest Adair. Therefore, it was beneficial both financially and socially for the story to be squashed in the press. After the murder-suicide at Briarcliff, Buddy gave up magic and stopped throwing parties in order to move on from the scandal. Over the decades, Buddy's fortunes declined, and at the time of his death in 1953, he had a fraction of his wealth left when he died of alcoholism.